everyone, I'm Mike Patty with Cine Samples and Hollywood Scoring, and this is our next video in uh, this uh, series that we're doing, uh, interviewing some of our friends from the music scoring community here in Los Angeles. And uh, today we're going to focus on the uh, low brass, the tuba and the chimbasso with Doug Tornquist. So uh, Doug's here with us. Thanks for joining us, Doug. Thank you, Mike. So uh, why don't we just get right into it? Um, why don't we ask, I've been asking the guys like some basic kind of orchestration questions. Mm -hmm. And what is the range of the tuba? The range of the tuba. Well, your basic uh, useful orchestral range is probably something like three octaves. Um, the lowest note would be what we call pedal C, which is the lowest note on the piano. And then an octave above that, and then that's middle C. And you can write that high, especially if you're going to write solos, it will probably be in the top of the bass clef staff. But All right. Well, um, as far as like the lowest notes, there's like, as far as like an orchestra, like the orchestration books usually say is, it's, uh, it kind of varies. Mm -hmm. As far as a scoring musician is concerned, what is the standard? Is it, is it the, what you said, the low B flat? Well, low? honestly, it's, I'm a little picky about that, but I think low C and low B flat are more notes, and people would disagree with me, but they're more used for effect. Um, I mean, you'll find that low C in Bruckner symphonies, so it's certainly been used in the standard repertoire. Um, I think if you possibly limited, limited yourself to low D, you'd be happy, and uh, it wouldn't be extreme. And it's, that note resonates very well with the rest of the brass section. Once you get into C's and B flats and A's, they don't, I believe, resonate as well. And so it's a different kind of sound. It's more of an effect, I would have to say. Okay, uh, and you said like, as far as a comfortable upper range, mm -hmm. um, where would you say is, is a good place to sort of stop? Well, if, if you know the guy you're writing for has an F tuba, then you can go all the way up to F, two ledger lines, bass club staff. Um, if you're writing solos, I think you'd be safe just staying uh, at the top of the staff, B natural, C, D. Um, all right, so what is the most common sort of things that you see on a film scoring session? Well, whole notes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, it's either uh, a lot of whole notes, a lot of you know, just sustaining uh, pads, I guess they call it, or the low percussive stabs, you know, the hits with the whole brass section and the drums, uh, sforzando, um, eighth notes, staccato. We see a lot of that. Okay, yeah, yeah, I know you play whole notes all the time, it seems, but what are some of the things that maybe us as composers should be aware of that maybe we should write more for? Types of lines and... Well, I mean, uh, you can certainly write solos for the tuba. I'm thinking of some famous ones you might know, you know, a lot of the Star Wars movies, Jabba the Hutt, that was a huge tuba solo. Yeah. Uh, Jaws, you know, that was a huge tuba solo. So it's not like it's something new but um, it seems like something new because it's a little bit uncommon. Um, the tuba has a different kind of timbre. It's got a little bit of a, it projects pretty well in that range. And, um, you know, any tuba player, any professional tuba player has, has studied concertos for years in college, so they've certainly got the ability to play solos. They're just never asked to play. I mean, anything that the cellos can do or the bassoons can do, um, I know from my own uh, orchestration studies, uh, when you get into the bass clef, there's a real lack of colors. You just don't have enough. You end up using the same things all the time. And uh, so you can use the tuba. Uh, the tuba can play really lightly and blends very well. Um, so to reinforce bass lines, um, if you like, you know. Okay, yeah, so actually that's a, that's a good point. Through the range, how does the dynamics work? Are you able to play all dynamics at all, <laughs> at all well, points through the range? Here's, here's a rule of thumb. Uh, we have a reputation for being uh, loud, but we're not always loud. We actually play pretty softly. And um, I will say one uh, thing I would like to say is the lower the tuba goes when you get into that extreme range, it's not so easy to really play loudly. Um, Say, for instance, a piano, you know, any key you hit in any range, you can really bang on it. The tuba just 
when you play alone out, the, it has to do with the quantity of air you use and how fast it is. It actually kind of blows your lips apart, and sometimes the note doesn't even come out. Okay, so, so what's a good, like, hey, give an example of that. Maybe it was, how low can you go and still have, like, an impact of it being well, loud and cutting mm -hmm. through? Here's the thing. A lot of guys, a lot of, a lot of orchestrators, composers, want to write... Um, a low D, I don't know why, but a lot of music seems to be in the key of D, or in, the, in a mode that centers around D. D minor. So, so there's that D. Um, if you really want the power, you should put it up uh, in this octave, which is one ledger line. I mean, that's really loud. And So that's the D right below the staff. Right below the staff, yeah. And you're, I don't know of anyone who's really going to get that kind of power down in the low register. And, in fact, often I ask an orchestrator, you know, if you really want this loud, do you mind if I take it up an octave? And he says, sure, sure, do whatever. I just want it loud. So, Yeah, because it's, sometimes it's a crack, a yeah, glatty sound that you yeah, want sometimes. Yeah, I think there are other instruments who might be uh, better suited for that. All right, so just a general question. What role in what you've seen, as far as good orchestrations go, what role does the tuba play? Um, I know, like, uh, sometimes when I'm orchestrating, I just kind of, like, just double it with the contrabasses, but um, is sure. that? Well, that's certainly, um, that's certainly going to work, and especially when you're mixing, if you can you know, dial us up and down, well, then you have complete control. Um, I will tell you, maybe I'll answer that question by saying some of the more interesting things I've seen. Um, I once did an album for a singer, and the orchestration was string orchestra, uh, four flutes, and tuba. Sounds a little strange, but... Um, the arranger wanted basically a string sound with the ability to put flutes in, and I'm t I mean, um, it was um, regular flute, alto flute, bass flute, I think, uh, and then have the tuba playing the bass lines very softly. And he, well, Elmer Bernstein would do this too. He just wanted the ability to add the tuba in if he wanted a little more presence. I mean, the nice thing about the tuba is it doesn't have to overtake the orchestration. You can use it to kind of fatten up the lines, which I think is what you're talking about when you double the bass. Um, you can use it to give more robustness to the trombones when you put it either in unison or an octave below the bass trombone. Or you can use it as sort of a, a, a low French horn. You know, a lot of writers will do that. They have four horns or six horns, and then they put the tuba, you know, on the bottom of that. Um, right. So those are some of the things I can think of. So sometimes in sessions we'll see, you know, more than one tuba. Uh, why is that? Well, I can only speculate because I, you know, I wasn't the orchestrator. But, but what I think, I think the orchestrator wants m more um, control of his final palette when he's going to be mixing. Um, often when there are two tuba parts, it's in octaves. So the part that I'm playing or my colleague is playing is, is surely doubled somewhere else. So that tells me that they're thinking ahead to the end stage. They might want the tuba, they may not want it. Um, a lot of films will be very heavy on the low end of instruments. There'll be like eight trombones and two tubas, uh, no horns, no trumpets. You know, it's all low and dark, so they want to uh, duplicate that sound. I, I think it's, I would have to say they just want a little more power. Um, they want more low end. And if you want to get really creative and write for the tubas and fifths and thirds and, you know, parts, um, you can do some really clever things. Well, we've done some things recently that, where the writers uh, did that as well. But now this is the standard uh, F tuba. C tuba. C tuba. Yeah. Now, um, there's also an F tuba. Yes. And when would you use that? Is that well? Do you kind of just interchange them based on what is written? Yeah, yeah. The F tuba, um, the purists will tell you that the C tuba and the F tuba are different instruments, more than just being the same thing in different keys. So the C tuba, this is the standard orchestral instrument in the United States, not in Europe. That would be a B flat tuba. Um, and then we use F tubas to cover some of the higher notes or the lighter notes. I mean, sometimes I'll play a very standard bass line on F tuba because it's a very small ensemble or it's just the right sound. Um, I usually just make a judgment call and um, 
usually uh, I, orchestrators leave that up to the players what horn we're going to play on, unless there's a really different color from one to the next. All right. Cool. All right, let's move on to the chimbasso. All right. So this seems to be an instrument that's become more and more popular, at least recently for low blat kind of stuff. Absolutely. So what's the, all right, so what is the chimbasso and how is it different from the tuba? Well, I get a little bit technical. Um, the chimbasso really historically comes to us from the world of Italian opera. Um, in scores of Verdi operas, you'll see there'll be three trombones, and then below that there'll be a line that says C, period, basso. The story is that chi, C is pronounced chi, so chi, basso became chim, basso. Hmm. Um, the myth is that Verdi created something like this. In some circles, this was called a Verdi bass trombone for Otello, which was around 1880, I believe. Okay, that's the history. How does it differ? The chimbasso is cylindrical bore. What that means is the bore size. This tube stays the same diameter all the length through the instrument, and then only here does it start to get bigger. Whereas a tuba and a French horn is conical bore, the tube starts out small and gradually gets bigger through the length of the instrument. So cylindrical versus conical, um, it gives the instrument different resonating properties. Uh, usually we would say the chimbasso has a brighter mm -hmm. sound. Um, it's, okay. yeah. Yeah, can you play a little? Well, something? sure. Right, all right, so basic orchestration question. What's the range? The range. What is written for this is usually from low D, again, that low D. Uh, maybe the highest note you would find a chimbasso on is uh, B flat in the, uh, the bass clef, and I mean the lower B flat. Uh, so wait, low D, two octaves? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, all those ledger lines. Yeah, yeah okay, Yeah. up to the yeah. B flat in the middle of the step. Yeah, yeah, once you get any higher than that, um, you'd probably just give that part to uh, a trombone, I'm thinking. Okay. Yeah. All right, what's the most common use of the chimbasso well, in film scores? Yeah, <laughs> in film scores, the most common use is um, the Sforzando uh, stab, <laughs> you know. And uh, it might not sound great all by itself, but, you know, with the whole row of trombones and some basses doing a snap piz, it's, it's pretty um, effective. Now, um, you can also use it in place of a bass trombone. Um, it can play nice and soft and resonant. Most writers don't. Um, usually, we are asked to reinforce the trombone sound to make a percussive, metallic, accented, uh, loud sound. Okay. Uh, that, I believe, is what people think of. But you can, can, you, you can actually play sort of sustained, like, supportive, yeah, lines. yeah, yeah. Believe it or not, that's what the instrument was designed for, you know. And when I play it in the opera, that's what I do, you know. But but we're never hardly ever asked to do that on a film score. I think the the consensus is that this is, uh, you know, everyone kind of yeah, everyone kind of makes jokes when I take it out of the case. That, oh no, look out, you know, yeah. stand back. So, uh, well, cool. Um, I guess do you want to just play something? Uh, well, maybe on the tuba to kind of serenade Ooh. us out. Serenade you out. Well, what would that be? Hmm. What if I played something from the orchestral world? Sure. Um, this would be. This is just a tuba excerpt. This is the the opening of the Prokofiev Fifth Symphony. It starts on a low F and kind of goes up an octave and a half, so it gives you an idea of the range of the tuba and the, um, the melodic uh, capabilities. It's a short little mm -hmm. snippet. Great, good enough. Yeah. Thank thanks you. so much for, uh, for doing this. And, uh, Pleasure, thanks for having me. We'll see you at the next session. All right, thanks for watching, that's the tuba.